Hello everybody and welcome to the Caralam Cymru revision sessions. The session this evening will focus on variation and evolution at A2 level and will be presented by Mrs Kavanagh from Connorskey High School. The session will last around 45 minutes where Mrs Kavanagh will run through the relevant content. If you have any questions during the session, please use the question and answer or Q&A section and we'll do our best to answer you. You will see there's a hyperlink in the Q&A section. If you're happy to leave your name and email address, we would love to keep in touch with you so that we can send you information about future events. You can click on the link at any time during the session. Today's session will be recorded and the recording and any relevant resources will be uploaded to the ESCOL website under the Caralam Cymru tab. Thank you, Mrs. Kavanagh. Over to you. Hello everybody and welcome to this final session. This is an A2 revision session and we're going to look at variation and evolution. So what are we going to have a look at in that in this session tonight? So we're going to look at what we should already know from this section from our GCSE and then build up on that into our A2 terminology that relates to variation and evolution. And then we're going to have a look at some exam questions on these particular areas. So if you remember from what we started at our GCSE studies, we spent some time looking at Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace. And if you remember, Charles Darwin put forward the idea and the theory of evolution and he wrote his book on the origin of species. And Around the same time, Alfred Russell Wallace, who was Welsh, was working on um, some ideas that were similar to Charles Darwin's. And Alfred Russell Wallace provided Charles Darwin with, with his work and some of his information to enable him to publish his book, which was called On the Origin of Species. And some of the theory that we know about variation and evolution relates to this idea of natural selection and the survival of the fittest. So how organisms are selected naturally, so very different to genetic modification, for example. And it's this idea of survival of the fittest where perhaps you might have those that are able to pass on their genes, who are able perhaps to run away faster from a predator than they survive and they pass on that genetic information as they reproduce. And then finally, two more ideas that we should be familiar with. Adaptation, so how organisms adapt. And from this idea, we have this idea that as organisms are able to adapt, then the faster they can adapt, the better chance they have of surviving and passing on their genetic material. And if they can't adapt, then we have that final idea of extinction that might take place. OK, so we're going to have a look at some key terms here to do with this topic. So these are new to A2 level. They're not terms that you'll have covered previously. So we're looking at speciation, which is quite a simple, straightforward term that refers to new species that are developing or evolving and they are produced or a new species is produced or evolved because there are two isolated populations. And there are different reasons why organisms might become isolated. And the first definition, you like, if you like, of allopatric speciation is when populations become isolated because of geographical barrier. So that could be a mountain range or it could be water, whether it's an ocean in between islands or a river. Then organisms that previously bred, once they are isolated due to these changes in the geographical area, then they have undergone allopatric speciation and they are no, a, no longer able to breed together or reproduce. And then secondly, sympatric speciation is when populations in the area become isolated and are not able to reproduce. And then we're going to look at these terms here relating to isolation. And we've got behavioural isolation, geographical isolation and morphological isolation. <coughs> 
And this is when populations, due to differences in their behaviour, the behavioural, they're, they're not able to reproduce, where we've got a physical barrier that we've mentioned earlier, where there may be a difference in reproduction, and then also a seasonal change there, um, which will lead to populations not being able to interbreed. So our next terms relate to something called the founder effect. And we'll look at this in a little bit more detail where we've got a type of genetic drift, which we will discuss later, which is a change in the frequency of alleles in a particular area. And we have a few individuals there that break off from the population, forming a new colony. And because it's a new colony and it's not as big as the previous population, we might have a smaller gene pool. And also then, because that gene pool is smaller, we might have more rare alleles. So that's something to think about there. And here we've got our definition for a gene pool, which is all of the different versions of genes and therefore the alleles in individuals that make up any particular population. And genetic drift, We've got variations in the frequency of alleles in small populations due to chance. OK, so I just want you to look at this video image here and I want you to think about the type of competition that is taking place in this area. OK, so pause the film here and I want you to just write down what type of competition is taking place here. So there's a specific term that we need to think about and then also think about what these animals are competing for. OK, so this is a type of intraspecific competition. It's called the term and this is competition between organisms of the same species. So here we've got the zebras competing with each other. And although they're in a nice big area, they would be competing perhaps for territory or um, a space to live and also for nutrition or food source and obviously over a period of time if that area became smaller then the competition would become greater. So the other type of competition that I want you to think about with the next film just have a look at it and think about what the term is that describes the type of competition and again what these animals are competing for. OK, so this type of competition is interspecific competition, which means it's between individuals of different species. And we saw there a number of different species. So they might be competing for a place to live or the territory within that area and also competing for food and water as well. OK, so this is something that perhaps you will have remembered from GCSE, but we need to just go into it into a little bit more detail here for A2. So discontinuous variation. There are two types of variation. So remind yourself of what continuous variation is, which we'll look at later, and discontinuous variation. So let's have a look at what discontinuous variation is. So this is something that you can categorise and put into a very clear, distinct group. So, for example, blood group or eye colour. So there is no variation away from those particular categories. So you either have blue eyes, you don't have a variation of blue eye colour. Again, for blood group, you belong to a particular blood group and you don't share any variation between that. So you are a distinct type of variation there if you have a particular type of blood group. So these characteristics, whatever they are for discontinuous variation, only appear in discrete values. So they cannot show any variation away from there. And the discontinuous variation, it's influenced by one gene, mainly, but occasionally too, 
and environmental factors have very little effect. So this is a reminder of what environmental factors might be, but in this case, environmental factors have very little impact here. So this should be a reminder of what you've perhaps looked at previously, that there is a limited range of values. We've talked about eye colour, blood group, also whether you can roll your tongue, and there are no values between that. You can either roll your tongue or you can't roll your tongue. OK, so continuous variation shows variation across a range and a scale of, of variation. And it's something that cannot be categorised. So you might have height as a type of continuous variation or weight and also perhaps the length of your foot or your hand span. And this produces a continuous range and in that range you can have any value. I just want you to think now about the two types of graph that you might be familiar with that show continuous and discontinuous variation. So just pause the film and make a note of the two different types of graph for these two different types of variation. OK, so for a discontinuous type of variation, your graph will be, if it was a bar chart, it would have gaps between. For continuous variation, it would be bars joining together and you would have a bell-shaped curve. And continuous variation, where we saw discontinuous was one gene, this is multiple genes and significantly environmental factors have a big impact on continuous variation. So here are some examples. So height can vary, weight, hair length and size of feet, and it shows a change in values over a particular range where you might have in your bell-shaped curve, so you might have um, a small number or a lower height, and then quite a few people in the middle part, and then at the other ends of your graph, where you have very tall people, you would have then a very small number again. OK, so we've got this idea then, thinking about discontinuous and continuous variation of this idea of monogenic or polygenic. And this refers to how the genes influence variation. So we've talked about monogenic here, which is related to discontinuous variation. So that is just controlled by one gene. And then polygenic is continuous variation where a number of genes come into play there. And what I want you to think about with polygenic variation, um, when, we, when we talked just previously there about height or weight, it's not just a genetic thing that, that occurs there. So a change in height might be due to, yes, inheriting the genes and enabling that, that genetic information to cause somebody to be tall or short, but it could also be due to an environmental impact. So if somebody does not have the right nutrition, then even though they have that genetic information, they may not reach the height that perhaps another person would. OK, so factors can be controlled by genes and the environment. Height is one that we've just mentioned. Also, um, whether somebody is predisposed to lung cancer is another factor that can be controlled by genes and the environment. Um, so some people, unfortunately, have pre the presence of proto-oncogenes in their um, body, which enables the regulation of the cell cycle. And if you are a smoker, then that exposes people to chemicals that convert those genes into oncogenes, which are active. And this leads then to uncontrolled cell division. And then unfortunately that can progress to lung cancer. So that's a factor that is a genetic factor, but also due to the environment by somebody making that choice to smoke. And then hair colour in particular here as an example in Siamese cats. This is determined not just by the genotype or the genetic information, but also by the environment. 
Um, Siamese cats have a particular gene that codes for an enzyme which darkens their fur and that is only active at a particular temperature um, which is below 31 degrees so that is why you might see a Siamese cat with a very dark tail so it's the extremes of the body that remain dark because they are colder so that is again controlled by the genes but also by the environment. And some very simple definitions here and images to show us that genetic information can be, for example, our hair colour, could also be whether we have our earlobe or not, could also be our eye colour and our skin colour as well, genetic, but also environmental could be a tattoo or piercings as well. So there are a number of different ways that we can be affected by the environment or genetics or both together. OK, so moving on then and looking at adaptations. So. There are a number of different adaptations that enable organisms to survive, and it's this idea of linking this back that if we are or if we do have an adaptation, then it's those genes that are passed on from an organism that can reproduce and that is a successful adaptation and it enables an organism to be successful. It relates this to the idea of survival of the fittest, that as an organism passes on that genetic information and is able to reproduce, then those adaptations are passed on as well and they can be either internal or external depending on the organism so here is an example where we have the loops of henley in the kidney and that allows animals that live in the desert to produce concentrated urine and minimize water loss so that is a, a physical adaptation um, for organisms that that live in the desert that enables them to survive also, there are adaptations related to behaviour, and this is when it may enable an organism to survive and to survive better. And if that is the case, then those organisms are able to breed and pass on that genetic information to the next generation. So it could be a change in behaviour. So if a mating call is a change in behaviour, that then means that organism is able to mate and pass on that information to the next generation. And then also we have a physiological adaptation which increases the chance of survival and this could be the regulation of blood flow through the skin and as that takes place it means that an organism can survive in a different environment and therefore again pass on those genes. And if an organism isn't able to adapt to its environment, then this is where, unfortunately, extinction of organisms may take place. So here is an example that you might remember, and I want you to just have a look at the screen and see if you can spot the two moths. And this was an example of a moth um, called the pepper moth or Bistin betularia, and let's see where it is. So here in this particular polluted, darker environment, this moth had a survival advantage here and was able to avoid being eaten by any birds. And here in the clean air, the lighter version of the moth was able to survive here because it blended in and was camouflaged within its environment. So if we look at these two types of fox, we can clearly see that the ears of the fennec fox are larger to enable it to maximise heat loss by radiation, but the ears of the Arctic fox are smaller, so it doesn't lose as much heat by radiation. So there are a number of different adaptations. You need to be aware of how to identify them in different organisms.
So we mentioned briefly the idea of natural selection, and this is something that Charles Darwin put forward, and it's how new species arise over time. It's a natural process, different to genetic modification, where we are involved in that process, and it's how species may develop over time. And really critical of this, if, if a species cannot adapt and is unable to survive in its environment, then it becomes extinct. So we mentioned the, the peppered moth earlier. Um, so this is just a reminder that we had the, the lighter version that was able to survive in non-polluted areas and the darker version that was able to survive in the more polluted regions. And then over time, as environments got cleaner, there was the chance that the darker moth would be more easily visible and then it was eaten by the birds and therefore its genes and its genetic information wasn't passed on. Whereas the lighter moth in the cleaner areas was able to survive and reproduce because it wasn't eaten as easily because it was more camouflaged. OK, so that brief film there just just shows us what what happens in terms of evolution. I'm going to show you that as, as an example here with the horse. So we can see what happens as this organism. Adapts over time, and I just want to highlight. Some of the changes in the horse over time. OK, so we've got this very small version of the horse 54 million years ago, and it's this that I Want to draw your attention to here it's the foot so you can see the height of the horse here so it's not very tall and it's got four toes here so if we move forward we can see that 28 million years ago myohippus and the foot shape has changed slightly you can see here that we've now got three parts to the foot rather than four in the previous version. So moving on, I'll just get rid of this. There we are. So we can see the changes here in the feet. So how as the horse is getting slightly taller, you can see it's becoming perhaps more like what we would recognise today as that fusing of the bones takes place here. And then just get rid of that. Here we've got another version of the horse as we are moving forward. And you can see here that this bone, if the foot is mostly fused as one, and just very, very close in terms of what we would recognise as a horse that we would see today. So this diagram shows all of those images as one so you can clearly see how the fusing of that foot bone at, at, at the first part of the horse there so ear hippus going right through now to equus today present day how that has enabled that horse to be a lot taller in terms of its height okay so evolution then takes place and we have a variety of phenotypes. If you remember, that's the outward expression of a gene, so what an organism might look like. And there may be a change 
and there may be a change in temperature, there may be a change in climate, there may be a change in the availability of a food source. And as that change occurs, then there is something called a change in the selection pressure. And what that means is that there's a change in how that organism is able to reproduce. So if there is a change in food, for example, then organisms that can survive on a particular variety of food will be able to reproduce and pass on their information. Whereas those organisms that can't survive on a particular food source will become extinct. So here we see that those individuals that have the advantageous alleles that gives them a selective advantage are able to survive and reproduce. So those animals that can eat a different variety of food and digest it and gain nutrition from that will be able to survive and reproduce because they have an advantage, a selective advantage over the other organisms. So then those organisms that do have the survival advantage are able to reproduce. As they reproduce, they pass on those advantageous alleles onto their offspring. And then over time, the frequency of alleles in the population changes. So where they were previously, we now have a higher frequency of the altered alleles and that enables evolution to take place. But there are things that affect evolution and how evolution takes place. So just pause the film here and have a think about the things that might affect evolution. So let's have a look. There's this idea of genetic drift that we mentioned earlier. And this is when we have a very small change in the frequency of alleles. Um, and it could be due to the fact that not all organisms reproduce within a popula popula population. Sorry. Um, and this is really noticeable in very small groups that become isolated from the full population. Secondly, there's this idea of a genetic bottleneck, and this happens when a population is reduced and reduced very quickly, and this affects the size of the population and also the variation within that population. So if the population is reduced due to perhaps an environmental change, then that can lead to what we call a bottleneck, a genetic bottleneck. So think of um, a bottle which is narrower. So that means that the population is um, affected and they are and have um, a lower amount of variation. And then finally, we have this idea of something called a founder effect. So this happens and we have a decrease in diversity. And this is when a new population occurs of organisms, but they are descended only from a very small number of ancestors. So their gene pool, so the amount of alleles that they have is very low. OK, so let's move on to this idea of speciation. And as you might think, speciation is when you get a new species arising. And we mentioned earlier that you can have allopatric and sympatric speciation, and it's to do with those barriers that are in place that enable the new species to form. So whether it is a physical barrier, so as I mentioned earlier, mountains or rivers or oceans that stop organisms from interbreeding. And then in sympatric, where the two groups are separated and therefore can't reproduce, the amount of genes available within that population becomes lower. And also there might be other pressures, other genetic pressures on there because they have moved and the area that they live in is different. OK, so just before we move on and look at the hardy Weinberg principle, um, just remember those differences then between allopatric and sympatric speciation. 
So the Hardy-Weinberg principle is a model that enables us to estimate the allele frequency within a population. So this is an equation that you need to be familiar with. The Hardy-Weinberg principle also enables us to determine whether allele frequency changes over time. And the basis of using the equation and the interpretation of the equation is this, that there is no mutations taking place, that no migration takes place, that no selection takes place other than natural selection, that mating is random and that there is a large population. So if you have any questions to do with um, the Hardy-Weinberg, make sure that you refer to these five areas and make sure that you make a note of this so that you are familiar with the reasons why or, or, or why what you need to bear in mind when you are interpreting any statistical information. So just very quickly going through the Hardy-Weinberg equations, we've got the frequency of the dominant alleles and also the frequency of the recessive alleles with P and Q respectively. And if a population is in an equilibrium, then P plus Q equals one. And what we need to think about then is the frequency of the three genotypes from this. So P squared would be the frequency of homozygous dominant, which would be two capital letters. Two PQ is the frequency of big A, little a, <clears throat> excuse me, or heterozygous within a population. And then Q squared is the frequency of two small a's, or homozygous recessive. OK, so we briefly covered this particular area of variation and evolution. We're going to have a look for the last part of this session at some exam questions to see how we get on. OK, so here we've got a question about finches, which, as we know, were one of the organisms that Darwin spent a lot of time researching when he went on his boat on the Beagle for five years. So the question says to us, finches that inhabit the Galapagos Islands have become known as Darwin's finches. They provide useful evidence to support a gene pool model of speciation. So there's quite a lot of information here, but the information we need to think about here is the gene pool. And the question is asking us to give a definition of that term gene pool. So pause the film now and write down what you would give as a definition for gene pool. Remember, this is a one mark question. OK, so let's have a look at what our definition is here. So it's all the alleles of all the genes in a population. So the gene pool is all the alleles of all the genes in a population. OK, so we've got quite quite a big question here. So this is certainly one. <clears throat> excuse me, that I would recommend that you pause. Have a good read through it and then have a go at the responses. So let's have a look at this very briefly. So we've got wheat grain here is determined by the plant's genetics, so their variety. The length of the grain filling period, time between fertilisation and harvesting. Plant breeders cross varieties of wheat in order to increase grain size. The photograph below shows the results of one such cross. So we've got variety A, variety B, and then we've got the extreme phenotypes from the hybrids. For each parental variety, the mode and the medium were the same. Arrow X here shows the mode and the median for the parental variety A, and arrow Y shows the mode and median for parental variety B. OK, so that's our, our background information. So what we need to do now is to look at the questions. So it might be an idea just to, to refer back to this as we are going through the next few questions. OK, so distinguish between continuous and discontinuous variation. 
you should give an example which is visible in the photograph for each one. So this is a three mark question here. So it's asking us to distinguish between continuous and discontinuous variation, first of all, and then we need to give an example that is visible in the photograph. OK, so pause the film, write down what you think the difference is between continuous and discontinuous variation, and then think about those photographs that we just looked at previously of the wheat grain and give an example. OK, let's have a look then. So first of all, we're looking at the difference between discontinuous and continuous variation. So discontinuous, it could be the colour, the hairs, smooth or wrinkled coat or shape. And we are thinking there for discontinuous as well, that it's the character is very clear cut. It's controlled by one single gene, so it's monogenic. We mentioned that earlier. And then for continuous, so we're looking at something that shows a range that can be measured, so their length or width. And we know that continuous variation is shown by more than one gene, so it's polygenic, and it shows graduation from one extreme to another in what we would traditionally know as our bell-shaped curve. So let's look at our next questions here. So again, if you want to pause the film and go back and just refer to the resource material at the start of the question, but it's asking us what is the total number of grains in the sample? So a straightforward mathematical question here. Then the second part here, the student calculated three different averages for the length of hybrid grains. The mean, Oops, was 6.57 and the two other values were 6.45 and 6.52. So with reference to the graph, so we've got to go back and look at the graph, state which of these values is more likely to be the mode and then give a reason for your choice. So that's two marks. So we need to think about looking back at the graph and then give a reason why it's more likely to be the mode, which one of those values and give the reason for that. And then the third part here, what evidence is there from the graph that the length of hybrid grains is not normally distributed? So, not normally distributed. So pause the film now, we'll just have a little think for a couple of minutes about what these responses might be. OK, so the total number of grains in the sample is 100, straightforward. Um, here we had different measurements and different averages, and we had to say which one is more likely to be the mode and give a reason why. So 6.45, and it's the most common there, and or it has the greatest number, highest bar. So a number of different variations there of response that you can give. And then thirdly, what evidence is there from the graph that the length is not normally distributed? And we can see there that we've mentioned previously about the bell shaped curve that you would expect. But this is not in that case. This is one mark, this question. So you could say we don't have a bell shaped curve. It's not symmetrical. That it's skewing to the left. And also a reference to there to the mean, mode and median. OK, so the final part of this particular question and quite a lengthy statement here, it says, consider the following statement. There is no significant difference in the length of the hybrid grains and the length of grains of parental type B. And this is a three mark question. So it says, describe any evidence from the graph above. So refer back to the graph to support the statement. Name the terms to use to describe the type of hypothesis represented by the statement and the statistical test that we could, could be used to test the hypothesis. So just have a pause for a minute 
This is quite a long question in terms of what we need to think about here, and then we'll have a look at the answers. OK, so what evidence have we got from the graph to support the statement? And then we're looking at the type of hypothesis and the statistical test. So the evidence from the graph is that we have similar mean or median to parent B. It's a null hypothesis and the test we would carry out would be the student t-test. OK, and our final question, very briefly, we've looked here um, at recently discovered fossil skulls from Ethiopia and they've resulted in different theories about the evolution of Homo sapiens. And you can see here we've got information related to the age here and then where remains have been found, fossilised information has been found in Europe, Africa and Asia. So the diagram opposite illustrates one of these theories called out of Africa that has been put forward by scientists. So we need to use the diagram to answer the following questions. So again, this is an idea to pause, make sure that you go back and look at the film and then have a look at the questions. So we're asking here, which species shows the greatest geographical distribution? So go back and look at the graph so which one of these species shows the greatest distribution geographically? So across those three different countries. And in this case, it's Homo sapiens because we can see it spreads across the three countries. State three ways in which the information given supports the out of Africa model of human evolution. Again, this is three marks. So one mark for each way here that you give. So again, refer back to that graph and the information. How does that support the out of Africa model? So we can see that Homo sapiens dates back to over 200,000 years ago in Africa. The oldest ancestor, Homo regaster, originated in Africa. And other suggestions are that Homo sapiens evolved from Homo rhodiensis which is in Africa, and Homo rhodiensis evolved from Homo antecessor, which were in Africa as well. So that's the idea of relating that, that evolution from those original ancestors that were in Africa. Explain why Homo erectus is likely to ye yield far more fossil evidence than Homo antecessor Mauritanicus. OK, so three ideas here why that Homo erectus is likely to yield far more fossil evidence. Let's have a look. So it lived for a longer time period. And also then, therefore, there would be more of them because they lived over a longer period and also they lived more recently. So those fossils will be better preserved. <laughs> 